Welcome to our Q&A today with Terry Williams. The topic is big law and mediation slash ADR. Is there a different approach? And I should say by uh, word of disclosure at the uh, outset, this discussion was actually uh, first anticipated in late 2019 when I contacted uh, Terry, who's my longtime friend, and asked him to appear as one of our speakers for a summit that was going to be presented on March 27 of this year. I don't think I need to say anything further. Uh, you do the math on those dates, uh, you can be sure that did not take place. And uh, even though the topics uh, and the title that I just read to you was the one we were going to go with at the time, uh, topic has remained the same. Some of probably what will populate those uh, responses from Terry have changed. Uh, obviously everything is like it never was before and certainly not like we thought it would be in late 2019. So let me uh, first of all introduce to you Terry Williams and I'm gonna start reverse chronological. Terry is currently the head of client finance operations at Hogan Levels, uh, one of the largest law firms on the planet. And before he was uh, doing that particular job for Hogan Levels, he was the global director of strategic pricing He's also, uh, before that, the managing pricing director for the firm. And uh, before his work at Hogan Lovells, Terry spent uh, a little better than a decade at AIG. And uh, there he did uh, various things. Uh, his last position there being vice president, associate general counsel, and deputy director of legal strategies. He was senior VP of litigation management before that. Chief Counsel for the Personal Lines Division uh, at, uh, prior to that. Uh, before going with AIG, uh, Terry was with a, a nationwide uh, law firm uh, or, or uh, insurance company. He managed a 20 person uh, uh, office of captive counsel. And uh, again, in full disclosure, I know Terry from his somewhat humble beginnings as we were both partners in a boutique little defense slash business litigation firm here in Atlanta, Georgia. And on a personal note, I know some of the people watching this feel like you are probably a very devoted fan to the sports teams that you follow. Uh, I will say Terry doesn't have a lot to cheer about this year as a fan for the Boston baseball team, but his loyalty is unassailable. Uh, if anytime your name is Williams and you name your first child Ted, and it wasn't boy child, I should say that. <laughs> uh, you've shown your dedication to the cause. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce to you my uh, personal friend and a person of great esteem, Terry Williams. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I uh, appreciate that introduction. Uh, it, it actually makes me feel very old uh, because we, we've logged a few miles there, my friend, in between all those roles. So. Uh, as Joe stated, I was slated to come uh, talk in the spring, and what I really want to accomplish today is take those remarks, kind of reflect on what they were initially going into the spring, kind of what happened with COVID and how that situation, the landscape might have altered. Uh, you know, really the only thing I would add in terms of my background is um, I, I manage or I have a line of sight for each one of those chairs. So as Joe said, you know, we were partners in a, in a firm here in Atlanta. And obviously I have that perspective around a partner practicing law. Um, I spent substantial time in-house, particularly with AIG, where I wore a lot of different hats, uh, managed some litigation divisions. Uh, and so I have a great perspective from the client side, having uh, sat in that chair for some time. And then most recently, uh, it, towards the end of my time at AIG, I was in their legal operations and then moved over to the pricing side for the law firm that I'm with now, uh, a bit of, um, you know, a bit of a change of role, but the same perspective, which is really about the business of law. Uh, on one hand, you're trying to minimize legal spend and on the other side, you're trying to enhance profitability. So it's kind of like a tripartite relationship with the partner chair, the client chair, and the business chair. So uh, kind of having set those uh, or that general parameters, we can jump right into the, the Q&A, Joe. Yeah, the first thing I'd like to know, Terry, is uh, if you could give us an overview, sort of a state of the industry, if you will. Um, going into 2020, going through 2020, going beyond 2020, 
uh, how how has your uh, concept of ADR uh, evolved from from what it would have been if we had had this talk in March to what you're looking at right now? And then I'm going to ask you to consult your crystal ball about what to strategists like yourself. Again, strategists are constantly living with thoughts, one foot in the present and the other in the future. Um, where, where do you see this going? And, uh, and what can we expect as an overview? And uh, I'll drill in with some specific questions as you, as you give those responses. But that's initially, just tell us what's going on out there and what do you see next? Sure, I think the great starting point is to talk about what the market drivers are. And, and where was the, the legal market, both from you know law firm perspective and from a client perspective, headed pre-COVID and where is, where is it headed now? So um, before COVID, uh, say Q1 in 2020, really, and, and I'm talking about the AMLAW 50 as, as a segment uh, or a particular area for purposes here, which are global law firms cross-border work, multiple, you know, depth of practice areas across a global scale. So for the AMLAW 50, the average demand was up about 1% in 2019. Uh, you know, it, it's been hovering above and below the, you know, accretive and dilutive plus and minus mark, um, but it was up first uh, Q1 2019. It actually ended up being up Q1 2020 pre-COVID. Um, Revenue from 2019 uh, had increased 5.7%, which is, uh, and again, if you're adding the numbers in your back of your head, what that means is that, you know, revenue really came off the backs of not an increase in demand, but rather an increase in rates. Um, it was a, a, a very aggressive year for most law firms in the Law uh, 50. So you had incremental growth in terms of market share or demand but you had much higher growth off, you know, revenue off the back of rates. Uh, along those lines, hourly rates had, had substantially crested the $2,000 mark. Um, that was kind of a watershed for firms that had more than one firm, more than one attorney charging over $2,000 an hour. Uh, we had a very active lateral market uh, in terms of partners. Um, you know, firms were kind of swapping chairs in terms of either entire teams or individual partners. Uh, you had essentially flat equity growth among that segment. So um, they weren't really rapidly increasing the partner rates organically. It was more market driven uh, and inventory levels were high uh, across those firms. Again, while demand was only 1%, people had robust inventories. They had files to work. Um, now that was. I want to just stop you right there and ask one question before you move on, because that's interesting. Uh, a lot of the upward tick in the numbers at that snapshot in time that you're talking about, driven by rate increases and a lot of migration, like you said, swapping uh, individuals or teams at, at these firms. Uh, just what is the why behind that? Why, why, why is, and why is that significant as, as you're about to move on? Why is that type of growth versus growth just tied to, as you said, organic growth? What, what's the significance of that difference? Sure, and, it, it, and I'll uh, fold it in. I'll get into this more detail uh, later on. But obviously, since 2008, the financial crisis there, uh, large companies have gotten much more aggressive around managing their legal spend. Um, they've expanded, you know, either through procurement or legal operations, uh, really aggressive management of the legal spend, law firms, you know, some of the folks on this call, I'm sure have heard, you know, people discussing, you know, requests for proposals or panel lists where they do what's called convergence and they cut down the number of providers, you know, maybe they may have 100 law firms they use and they, there's an edict that goes out that we're going to cut that down to 20. So, Market competition has increased, more active management around the legal matters of, you know, uh, what goes out, what stays in, there's just much more control. So you have that, you know, in terms of demand, that's being incredibly myopically managed or, or, or by the client side. So, you know, but what we see is that the uh, untethered from that, the revenue stream has continue to have that growth. So while the amount of legal work that exists out there has been essentially flat, firms have been able to increase the bottom line through rates. 
Great. And I, and, I, and I appreciate you making that clarification because as you move forward and you talk to us about what's going on post pandemic, um, I did want to, I did want you to emphasize there, it, it, you've got people tuning the dials very carefully and, and all the talk of, of management and, and scrutiny and conscientious attention to getting this, this growth and growing revenue. How, how does that hyper attention to, to, to that type of growth, how is that, is that more affected by something like kick, kicking the board over, which is basically end of Q1, COVID kicked the board over and all the players that were there and all the, all the, all the minute changes that have been made and dial-ins, is, is, is it more remarkable to see what happens after that then or, or not? I, I get the sense of Actually, that we... the reality was, uh, and, and I went full on, so I was in-house with AIG in 2008 and um, saw what a disruption that was in the market. Anybody who read the headlines, they might have happened to see AIG in the news around that time. It was a slightly significant event. Uh, and one of the byproducts for uh, AIG at that point was a catalyst. And, and I'm going to jump ahead in my remarks because it's salient to this answer. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, 2008 from the financial disruption was, um, you know, all other spend by clients in every other dimension from, you know, photocopying to microchips had a very strict procurement process, but professional services existed outside that. They just said, law's different, we can't touch that. Um, in 2008, they just broke through that glass ceiling and they said, look, it's, it's, they're all vendors. I don't care if they're, you know, they're an LLP or, you know, whatever the services they provide, it is paper towels and legal products, it's the same. And now I'm being a little overly dramatic, but it was, a significant shift because, uh, you know, when you think about the, the legal spend globally, and we'll take AIG for an example, uh, when I left AIG in 2015, their global legal spend was $2.5 billion. So they had a very well articulated um, strategy around how they did law firm management. And, you know, if we're saving 10 to 20 percent off $2.3 billion, not insignificant numbers. So I fully expected that, and, and I was full on board to say, this is just like 2008. Yeah, there's, a, there's the disruption in, you know, uh, drivers are different, but the downstream impact is going to be the same, which means clients are gonna hoard cash, um, cash being king. They don't know how long, how deep, what's gonna happen here, uh, which means all discretionary legal spend, your mergers and acquisitions, your the, your, hey, we've got a great idea about this legal area, let's hire a firm to give us an overview. All that's gonna get pulled in. Um, and they are immediately going to um, go after law firms and, and other outside vendors. Uh, again, I, you know, I'm uh, kind of a uh, poacher turned gamekeeper, so I can talk both sides of this, <laughs> is that they were gonna look and say, who are the people who are going to be, you know, that we can impact from a client side who are the least sympathetic? Well, lawyers are somewhere around one or two on there <laughs> and that they would immediately go after law firms and say, we're just slashing. We're slashing your your rates, your budgets, everything. And um, we we did a lot of preparation and, and strategy. And I, you know, did a lot of, uh, you know, training within the firm about you know what happened with law firms in 2008 and you know how to manage your way through it in, in near term and we really expected this to be a long tail that um, you know inventory would dry up, demand would drop through the floor, um, really didn't know what what it was going to mean. I mean you know law firms drew down on their capital to kind of hold cash. We all saw in the market a lot of, you know, um, they changed comp cycles for associates, for partners. We saw that kind of from local, mm -hmm. regional, all the way to the global. And, so, and so really. Just the, so just to hit the pause, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but just no. to hit the pause right there on that. Let's just say we're, this is March 27th. COVID had not happened. You're standing at a rostrum uh, here in Atlanta at our, our big summit. And you were about to tell everybody what, your vision was for ADR and mediation uh, as applied to big law. 
give, give us a, a thumbnail sketch of what that talk would have looked like before you tell us about what really happened. So at that point, I think it, it, it almost a, a dovetail on my remarks before, I think there was a mix of, I was going to talk about, you know, embedded opportunities, but also kind of thoughtful reflection. So for example, one of my things that I was going to talk about was the application of our, our uh, artificial intelligence within mediation setting, you know, and, and kind of the, the ethical, you know, debate around that of, you know, where you're, uh, taking out the human element and considering that and, you know, how much analytics is the right amount versus how much is too much. You know, are we going to apply AI to be problem solvers as opposed to ultimate arbiters or guides on there? Again, we were going to talk a lot about concepts and theoretical. Um, we were also going to talk about, you know, the, the Singapore Accords, you know, the Singapore Mediation Conventions and you know, how we're monitoring that and is that really going to have a high rate of adoption and kind of change things, make it more homogenous globally and the way people embrace that. Neither one, I've not heard a peep on either one of those topics, not that I read it on a day to day, but those are not things there, you know, to get to kind of jump ahead to the really meaty stuff, Joe, and I'm happy to take it out of order is, you know, I did have litigation funding on my list. And I believe that remains to be true as an area of opportunity for uh, people in the ADR space. So, you know, just kind of, I, and I'm gonna refer back to my actual slides there is that, you know, litigation funding has had a 414% growth over a four year period. Um, the value of the investments are in the billions at this point. You know, we're talking about high stakes financial litigation intellectual property litigation. Uh, the people behind it are, they're portfolio investors. They're not lawyers. They're not interested in the outcomes. They are aggregators and investors. Um, I felt that, that this is an area that's had uh, remarkable growth on the front end uh, and really hasn't hit its crescendo um, in that it was still an emerging area, but you know, it's on the lips of any firm that has large scale uh, litigation department. They're getting more and more, they're thinking about, you know, litigation funders, how do we work with those, them on those cases? How do we replicate their practices and their model for evaluating which cases we invest in or not? The embedded opportunity there is, it's, it's had astronomical growth, but like I said, it's really not hit its, its top end um, my remarks at that time were to say, look, there's a future opportunity there because people want return on investment. And not everybody who's investing in those litigation fundings are lawyers who would appreciate, you know, and, and I'll quote my good friend Joe Murphy that, you know, this case may resolve in a very short period of time or it may resolve in a really long period of time. I have somewhat limited control over that. And, um, you know, I think that those people, the backers, they're going to start to get itchy feet at a certain point and say, well, I understand this whole law thing and you've told me to be patient, but I've invested substantially in your, you know, in your product and in these cases, when do I start to see a consistent return on my investment? Um, I think post COVID that becomes an even stronger pressure. Uh, on those because litigation portfolios at this point are a bit dry. You've had, you know, in the U.S., all kinds of state courts, you know, shut down in time, you know, and that wasn't just the U.S. I mean, the entire uh, litigation system in, in Germany went to a full halt uh, at, at that point. So globally, litigation comes to a, a screeching halt. Well, the people who have invested billions in these litigation fund cases um, you know, that's fine. But now that, you know, what they were sold of, well, it'll take three to four years to resolve that. They kind of say, yeah, you know what? We don't know when things are going to pick up again. This could be a seven, eight, nine, ten year tail for some of these litigations. And you throw in the fact that the risk profile on those clients have changed. You know, clients who had a lot of assets are now moving them around. They could be moving offshore. And now there's a liquidity concern of, great, we've got a massive judgment. How do we collect on it? So I think as an industry, Joe, to 
kind of give away one of my tips at the end. I think litigation funders, if you know them, contact them. Start making those contacts now with those folks because they have an interest in that little tripartite relationship with the client, you know, themselves in the law firm uh, to kind of move these things along where historically they would invest and they would monitor and let counsel take the lead. I can see the litigation funders by push of their investors say, we need you to be a little more active. What's going on? What are our options to maybe ex access some of this capital early on? You know, I have liquidity concerns because a lot of times these involve very individuals who are well capitalized, but they're capitalized globally. You know, they might be an oligarch in petroleum in Russia and they've got assets all over the world. So um, I could see the folks on this call and a lot of these funding agencies are U.S. based. So if you know people and you have them in your Rolodex, that actually might be a good opportunity to start laying the foundation for your services, reaching out, give them an opportunity, you know, get them to start thinking about their portfolio. And maybe there were cases that were not really in the bubble, but now they're in the midpoint and they start thinking about what their uh, exit strategies are that's in their interest, that's in their client interest. No, I, I, one, one thing that you said, and I love that it's somewhat euphemistic phrase, the client financial profile has, is, is shifting or, or subject to change. Um, I, I've seen that as a mediator in uh, the case I did recently. It was a, a large uh, global company, self-insured, um, in a business that uh, if I told you what it was, you'd go, wow, they got to be hurting. And they are. And part of, the, part of the driver there was, on the one hand, we don't know when the courts are going to open up again. And, you know, this particular company could look very different financially. They're voluntarily trying to resolve a case where they were the defendant. Um, two, two or three years from now, who knows? You might be talking to a bankruptcy trustee in that, in that situation. And it's interesting being a lawyer, I, the, the two things I thought as a mediator, I thought, well, this creates some dynamics we don't normally have in mediation, some exigencies. Um, as, a, as a lawyer, I was thinking, if I'm the defense lawyer who's representing this client, I'm basically hearing someone say, I may not have money two years from now. So I'm thinking, as a lawyer, I've got to think about uh, my client's interests, obviously, but I'm also interested in, in my client as a resource for providing uh, money for me to make to put food on my table. So it's, it's I, I don't know how much of from again, being in every seat as you've been, as you're, as you're managing these client fin finances and, and managing the situation for the client, how much in the back of your mind that you, are you thinking as a firm uh, about the, the struggles these companies are facing and their ability to, to continue to be a, a source of revenue for your firm to the extent you can speak to that? Sure. Um, well, we do. We, we come from a, a position of empathy because a lot of these are long-term clients of the firms, long-term clients of the partners. So I, having sat in that chair, understand you really want to be with them through thick and thin. Um, you make the best near-term accommodations that you can and we have for COVID uh, for them. And, you know, really there, there are sections of the industries where you know, clients that we had that are in hospitality, travel, those areas, you know, they, they've just gone down, you know, to a very low point. And obviously we've done everything we can to support them uh, where they're at, but then they're, you know, and again, this is where the dynamics are a little different for a global client, because while we have a lot of clients in that space, we also have clients who are, you know, we're very big within DC in the global regu regulatory space. We have, all the big pharma clients who are working on all, you know, the vaccines um, that are going on and, you know, that work is is through the roof. So um, and I'm going to kind of swing those remarks around, Joe, because we are accommodating that section of clients. But we have, you know, an equal number of clients who are seeing massive upswings in their business um, related to this. So it's now April, May 2008 firms kind of come to me and says, you know, what should we be thinking about? And I, and I ponder seriously what's happened in 2008 and kind of set out where I think things are going. Um, the reality is at the end of the day, it is a very different scenario than 2008. There were 
it, it's, you know, there were similarities and, and you wanted to assume there were, you know, there was a correlation, but there really wasn't um, because it, it, the core of 2008 was really purely financial. It, it was financial on big business and markets. This is an external agent, okay, that, that there is little control around right now. So you had law firms and clients who all kind of held their breath and said, is this going to be like 2008, 2009? And then we saw exactly what you talked about, which was there were parts of the industry that were severely affected. And then there were parts of the industry where it was surprisingly business as usual that there really was, you know, that, that maybe the nexus of their work moved or some of their work slowed down, but other parts accelerated. But there was, there was very quickly an equilibrium about it. So, you know, where are we coming out of, uh, you know, 2000, 2021? Well, the, most of the sources that we look to, um, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, other large institutions that ponder on this, where I get my data from, they believe that demand will be up again next year. Now, some are saying first half, some are saying second half. Um, everyone, in, you know, that I've been talking to, you know, the banks, but also the law firms, um, they understand that profitability is going to come off rates. And the plan is, unlike 2008, where everybody said, hard stop on rate increases, we don't want to do anything, we don't want to be disruptive. Everyone's taking a rate increase in this year within that band. Um, there may be some relativity to their sensitivities around certain practice areas versus others, but there's still going to be aggressive rate increases. Um, we're still seeing a very active lateral market. Again, for different reasons in that you may have a very strong team in a pocketed area and the rest of the firm is struggling mightily and they now are looking for a home that maybe is more aligned and supportive of their practice. You will see the flat headcount growth. I think at most firms, a lot of firms are deferring their, their next year classes. Um, the only difference I'll say is I think inventory has dropped. Um, there's not as much work going out and, and that's to be understood that we saw that 2008, what can, can you defer it? Can you keep it in house? Okay, if you can't, then you send it to a law firm. And I think they're applying that um, philosophy. So, um, you know, from an in-house perspective, I, I looked at these and I, and I think that uh, my, my points are essentially the same. Um, and, and we talked a little bit about this offline, Joe, is I think they're trying to defer certain legal expenses that are uh, optional for them, like I said, m a work, uh, other work that, that they can control the flow on. But there's a huge amount of segment of work that they have no control on, one being litigation, um, particularly, you know, high complexity, high risk litigation. Uh, and there's also, you know, we in prior years coming into 2020, we were in a very increased, increasingly complex and demanding regulatory involvement uh, environment. You had all major jurisdictions are getting in there, regulating this. Those are two things that a law firm can't say, eh, not this year, go catch <laughs> us in 2022. Um, those are being, we'll, we'll gear back up. You know, from a government standpoint, their coffers are low, taxes are down. Well, going after big companies is often a quick way to, you know, increase those based on violations or other, you know, taxation or other issues where they may revisit those. Um, I think the analogy I used before is true also that while um, while certain legal spend is discretionary, litigation isn't. And right now, you know, when you were a kid, you'd have the hose and you would turn the hose all the way up and the water shooting out and then you'd crimp it and it would water would balloon up and it would stop to a trickle on the end of the hose. That's where we are in the litigation environment. And, and at some point that is going to unkink and everything that was pending is going to accelerate out and then everything that's that's coming out of the spigot at the house is going to come through and you know from a strategy standpoint we you know i would say probably in the next six to 18 months litigation will hockey stick um, we saw it in 2008 that is a similarity now um, for you get to do everything from real estate to you know insurance uh to supply chain disruption you know contracts you're going to see a plethora of litigation come through. 
Um, people aren't so much talking about the recession. I was going to bring that up before. Um, I, I, it, it was more theoretical. People were saying about the what ifs. I think people are really looking at the economics of what's happening, you know, on a day to day basis. But I don't really hear a lot about the uh, uh, recession, nor do I hear much talk about legal service providers and tech really eclipsing large law firms. I actually think that from a qualitative need standpoint, you know, law firms, the pendulum swinging back towards them and that um, the work that's going out the law firms is going to be the most complex, the highest risk, the stuff where they, they can't say, look, we'll have Deloitte or somebody else handle it. We need the best law firm, the best team on this. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to, at this point, ask you to pull out the crystal ball in earnest and, uh, you, you've talked about what we're going through right now, and obviously, as that hose, to use your analogy, opens up the initial, the initial surge that will occur. And again, whether it's you know first half, second half, uh, 2021, or some later point, there's going to obviously be something in between, some some uh, midterm uh, issues that and then long term once we're completely pulled back out of this again and normalcy somewhat takes effect and and how that normalcy will be affected by anything we're doing now i'd like to ask you for firms that are 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 looking at the current situation and uh and and heading into next year how do you see the role of adr whether it's uh, mediation or or arbitration uh helping deal with the current situation where there's a complete throttling of, of the litigation process and yet the pressure is still there these cases still need to be moved business still needs to be accomplished what 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 can adr do to help relieve some of that pressure in the short to medium term sure so and, and um, one of the things that i was actually responsible for at aig when i was with the legal operations group is i headed up adr global strategies for all of uh, AIG. So I see this as an incredible lever for clients and, and law firms um, to partner. Um, you know, the general example I gave is that when um, AIG, we would go through uh, large scale catastrophic events like Sandy or Katrina, um, we absolutely coordinated large scale mediation uh, to manage all the claims that came through. Now they were all covered events, but you're think you're talking about uh, you know variable complexity from high complexity to low uh, complexity. But the the frequency, the amount of claims was unbelievable, and we we centralized that process with firms and with you know ADR providers because we knew that there was these waves of claims that need to be processed. Um, I think the embedded opportunity for you know, law firms, uh, for folks in your space and for clients is to um, dust off that tool. Um, you know, I came out of legal operations and, and one of the un unfortunate side effects or one of the un unintended consequences I think is that legal operations got very quantitative. So it was all about managing the legal spend and they kind of took some of the important qualitative tools out of the toolbox which is you know what the outcome is uh for matters and and i see this as a period of time where that pendulum will swing back because um you know you know joe you and i've talked about it i think you know the real estate uh is one of the areas that's going to see you know, high volume litigation where be it a distressed company or let's just take uh, any you know, large company that has, you know, eight floors and in a, a building on Madison Avenue and has had its entire workforce, you know, working uh, seamlessly from home for seven months. They're reevaluating re their real estate model. Yeah, and, like, you know, mom, no offices, right? It's exactly. Yeah, they can do this. And they go to their land, landlord and say, look, I know we just signed that 17 year lease, but, you know, what do you think you can do for us? You know, that is happening in large scale within New York. Now, when you when you get behind that, you know, the real estate within New York is, is polarized around very few large players. Uh, so those disputes are going to funnel up. 
Um, you know, just taking the insurance piece because that's predominantly where I came out of on the client side. You know, obviously, you know, right now the status is it's not a covered event. You know, language is pretty consistent. There's no physical damage. Um, but we can't deny that some states have kind of come in and started putting their finger on the scale. Um, you know, some have gone so far as introducing bills which say, well, you know what? We know what you meant by that language, but we're just going to get the white out and kind of wipe that out. Um, some other ones, and this is, again, the embedded opportunity, some other states have come and proposed and said, you know what, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to propose a bill which is more of a reimbursement act. So we're asking the insurance companies to accept the claims and then they'll get reimbursed from a fund. Uh, and that's been kicked around both at the federal level and a few states have um, put that in. Well, you, Joe, you can understand, you know, that would change the landscape completely if they you amended that and say, look, accept the loss, despite your provisions on, on your physical damage. And, you know, we'll go on that. You're going to have massive waves of matters being submitted. And there's, you know, unless you, it's, let's assume arguendo, you get beyond the coverage issues there and it actually becomes programmatic, you know, they're desperately going to need ADR services. I mean, there'll be a standard process for the ones that are passed through, but then there's going to be, uh, you know, a, a rather sizable kernel of ones of, it's not so much them accepting liability, but the damages, Joe, which is how much. And that I could see where they would need the intercession and not going to go full litigation on it, but they need a full on, you know, ADR program, mediation, arbitration to process these things through to actually maybe put the number on those claims. So then it's finalized and they can pass it through. So um, let, me, I mean, let, me throw, let me throw you a curveball. Uh, this is not something we talked about, but I, I know you're going to be able to, to fill this like the pro you are. Uh, I've been on some panels recently where we've talked about virtual jury trials. In fact, I'm, I'm speaking on a panel tomorrow where that's the topic. And uh, one of the uh, speakers who's joining us is an attorney in Texas who actually tried one of the very first virtual jury trials from stem to stern. So she's got lots of interesting things to say about that. Just as I'm hitting you here and, how, and as it, uh, it strikes you as someone in your position being able to see from a global perspective, is that a thing? Is, could, could, that, could that take hold in any way that would help bridge this gap between uh, now and in two years from now or three years when we might be fully out of the woods with this? Is that something, uh, let's just say it's a case where mediation or arbitration can't really do the trick. You need, you need a jury to, to make some kind of decision. What are your thoughts about virtual jury trials as a standalone issue, and and I'm not going to ask you to to go into that with all of the you know all of the pluses and minuses that might might come up with that. But just what what would be your reaction to someone who would say a client that would come to you and say ADR is not going to work, but can you can we do something like a virtual jury trial? Um, I, you know what I, I would take it on as a scientific experiment. <laughs> I hope that doesn't sound like I'm punting, but really. Um, because I, people come to me and say, you know, uh, Kleinex is doing this really crazy thing, what we should do. And I'd say, don't get too entrenched how you feel about it. Let's treat it as a science experiment. Um, you know, litigators and in, in certain segments of the industry, like insurance companies, um, you know, they're very entrenched in their ways. And I could see them kind of bristle at the idea of, I can't see the sweat on their brow when I'm doing going to Wadir with them. And, you know, how would I, how would I handle a Batson challenge and, you know, do the parade of horribles on why that's not a good idea. But as this goes on and we have, and I loathe to use the term, but we'll use it, the, the new normal, I think that, you know, some people will stand up and say, you know, we have to square up on this. We can't defer this if we've exhausted everything else. We can't defer this. Let's treat it like a science experiment. Let's let's do this and understand. Let's pick the right case. Let's pick the right jurisdiction. Um, let's do the research. Talk to people who have done this before, and don't treat this as a we're trying to do a jury trial. You know, through an iPhone, but rather, you know, we're in a new frontier. 
how do we, what kind, let's do this and then talk about the experience we had, um, you know, and, and kind of unwind it from there and kind of plan the next one. I would see, I think law firms will be pushed by the clients in that space. I think the clients will be more um, willing to, to take that experiment and move that forward. I think you, you know, I'm not precluding individual law firms from saying, hey, we're going to be a pioneer. I just know how the industry kind of moves. Mm -hmm. And until your client asks four or five times, you really say, OK, this isn't going away. We need to you know, change how we do things. Right. You might famously remember, Terry, I was the last lawyer, I think, on the planet who wanted to give up WordPerfect as a uh, word processing format. <laughs> I became famously known as a Luddite in our firm for that. But uh, but yeah, we are reluctant to change until it's client driven. And and I, and I think just in addition to the, the reluctance to change, would, would you agree with me that uh, th there's really no premium on being a, a pioneer and trying to be a, a renegade uh, with that comes the risk that there's bad client outcome and through a conventional process, it's not, the client's not going to look to you for, for, for blame necessarily, but if you suggest something novel and let's face it, every trial has a winner and a loser, uh, someone's going to lose that virtual jury trial and their, their client probably, unless they were the ones driving the process might, you know, really do some second guessing on that decision. You know, that's true. And that's why I think it's about picking the right case, having the right client, the right law firm. So back to my, you know, managing attorney days, you know, I'd have a great deal of eggs, particularly with young lawyers who are going their first jury trial. Or, or more importantly, let's take one that was very close to potentially being excess exposure. And a lot of times it wasn't so much that the attorney was worried about trying the case uh, or even the outcome. It was about you know, who is the blame going to be assessed on? So it was one of those where getting everybody in the room and saying, we're all in this together. We're all, nobody's going to finger point. We're all in this together. We all, you know, let's go through the case. This is the right one. We got to make the stand here. And I think that's where you'll, you know, that's why I said it's, it's going to take the right case, the right client, and the right firm to move that forward and to say, we're not going to decide on one case we agree that we're going to do 10 of these in a year and uh, we'll stay away from West Virginia and lower, you know, Louisiana and Cook County, but we're going to pick some good venues for this and, and, and try this out. Um, and, and clients, I think there are clients who actually look at that and say from, you know, let me guess this. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have to pay for travel uh, there. I'm, you know, probably not going to have to pay maybe some some other overhead pieces and people like me will come in and break out my calculator and put all the numbers in and say, you know, here's the projected ranges for the fees and the costs. And, um, you know, it's worthwhile. Here's, you know, the outliers in the model, what we expect to happen and do all kinds of model financial modeling, statistical modeling on outcomes and put it all up for them and then look for that sweet spot. So. Well, but let me ask you another question along those lines. And, and you mentioned your experience with AIG coming in aggressively with, 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 with ADR and mediations to help process an unprecedented number of a volume of claims. Um, I would imagine at that instance in time and, and anything that we see as a, as a similar type uh, mobilization with COVID, uh, the word we haven't really used a lot yet today, but I think would be necessary is cooperation. Uh, there, uh, I, I would imagine at the time you're talking about when AIG is making this decision to do that, there's there's a buy-in from the other side of the bar that the, that the attorneys for the plaintiffs uh, collectively or individually recognized there's value there's there's a value to this there's a there's they also recognize that need. What how how would you in in, in the position you're in right now in looking at COVID and you're advising a client. Um, and you're, and you're also thinking about the other side. How, how do you sell this? How do you create buy-in for both sides on something that one side might see an advantage to the delay or the stall or the kick the can, the can for another two years? And I'm asking that question very selfishly, by the way, because I see this in ADR a lot of times. If you look at what we're going through right now, one side or the other seems to be a little more, um, a, a little less motivated by the pause that's been hit on the court system. 
some the people that have the money, it's already in their bank account. The people that want the money, uh, making the claims very often are more, how do you level that and get equal buy-in to something that's a solution for everyone, but, but maybe some need it more than others? Yeah, that, it's, that's a, a dense point, and, and I do follow you, and I think that it's somewhat, as you said, um, it's somewhat subjective to the dispute in the parties um, in that, uh, you know, let's take, let's take that there is a reimbursement fund that gets set up. You know, South Carolina passes its bill, and suddenly there's a super fund for these kinds of claims. Um, you know, the, a, a large uh, insurance carrier is going to assess this from a very economic model, which is, look, liability is pretty much a done issue. What we're trying to do is manage um, the amount of money that's going out for us and making sure that the reimbursement matches that, that there's parity there. So you have alignment on that side, which then will motivate the defense lawyers and they'll select the firms that understand that this is really a volume business, that this is not about you know, taking this to the Supreme Court of South Carolina, that this is about 99% of these cases are about moving through a process. And then, like you said, the plaintiff's bar is aligned, which is they understand there's a system for this, um, that they're, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's congregation of the types of claims that are going through this. And there may be some outliers, but for the most part, the lawyers and the plaintiff's bar are involved in this, understand their interest is, is uh, moving this through the system. I think, you, as you said, when you get into the more individual disputes, um, that's where the, and there may be more dynamic tension between the parties about who's motivated um, by this. I think sometimes you, you know, you got to find your pressure points and, and kind of leverage those. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not necessarily advocating for embellishment, but you get into some of those drivers of, we don't know where the asset's going to be. You know, you can wait and, you know, who knows, you might be talking to a bankruptcy attorney in another three years for this or, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, the, I think the courts are slowly opening up again and they may be um, more willing to get actively involved in those secondary and tertiary drivers as opposed to saying, look, this isn't, you know, we're just going to pick up the cadence of the case somebody might file an, a novel motion around making sure that assets are secure, that they're identified, that they're, you know, held in a place that can be accepted. There isn't a movement around those sorts of things. So um, I think it's a variable scale, but a, but a point well taken in that there are people who can sit on their hands. Um, what was the old phrase? Deny, delay, don't pay, um, you know, and, uh, you know, but the long term, you know, an economist or somebody in finance would look at them and say, that's not a good long term strategy. It just isn't uh, long term. The, the, the byproduct of that is that you will skew your payments at the end of the day. You're not making money um, by by saving it all there. You're you're better off disposing of things because in a lot of times cases don't get better over time. They just don't, um, you know, we, you and I as litigators know that, you know, in the turn of a day or a doctor's visit, a case could turn uh, where somebody gets a, a less fortunate diagnosis or becomes a candidate for surgery or something yeah. like that. A and theoretical, uh, a theoretical permanent injury becomes a permanent injury. If you're right, to get exactly. Involved. And, uh, you know, and that is the part of the risk profile that, you know, you, that large companies understand individuals with assets it's kind of a different game. Well, let me ask you this question. We've got about 10 minutes left. And, uh, you know, COVID has been that sun that has blocked out all the other stars by its presence in our uh, society, culture, industry. And we've talked about it a lot today. And I think people are very anxious to hear what experts like yourself have to say on that. But I want to I broaden this out a little bit and give you an opportunity before we finish up. Uh, as you sit there in your watchtower with your binoculars and you're looking out over the horizon, what else are you monitoring? What are you looking at? I, I, know, I know you've got a much broader scope and perspective of what's, what's important and what you think is going to be important to think about in the future. So in the context of ADR and mediation, what else are you looking at right now that would be of significance to anyone um, who wants to seek, you know, seek your guidance on what's next. 
Well, I mean, I, I, the appearance of being redundant, I would go back to some of the themes in that, um, you know, where we are now is going to give rise to some novel areas. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, you know, in terms of standard coverage, uh, you know, litigation, you know, business interruption, those sorts of things from COVID. Um, but I, I think that, you know, beyond that, you're going to have, you know, some novel tendrils and areas of law that will go on that will be emerging over time here. I mean, a lot of the policy language came out of, you know, the recent SARS. And I think you'll you'll continue to see that ripple effect from COVID on both sides where companies will be reacting to that. So let's say, you know, within the insurance industry, they're going to have to they're going to find the holes in the policies and have to shore those up. But, you know, um, what about from injury from exposure where, you know, where people may not necessarily, you know, we in New York, there's a big thing about the herd, you know, not herd immunity, but I think it's the local contact rule where identifying who patient zero is and then drawing a circle around that. Well, a lot of times we're hearing it's, you know, it's a house party, for example, you know, it's a house party. And, you know, the parents are there. Well, by extension, what liability is around there? When they move into indoor dining, uh, you know, and some states have proactively, uh, here in Georgia now, I can see the legislative, you know, we're not responsible for what happens, but that doesn't preclude people um, actively, you know, making those claims. I, again, at a broader level to answer your question, I think it's about the, the folks you know, the audience here looking around corners and saying, where is the next swell going to be of work? Where is the next motivated group of people who are going to be looking to engage our services as a strategic lever? Um, you know, my world, it's all, you know, euros, pounds, dollars, and decimal points. But I haven't forgotten that strategic need around there, which is, I go back to the litigation funders and, you know, I'm involved in that because it is all the dollars and cents on that. But I also looked at this and said, what a novel area for someone within the ADR space to create this niche for themselves and become the pioneer in that area and really corner the market to an extent. Uh, you know, uh, something you and I were talking about this morning, the global world has gotten incredibly small with just my iPhone. I mean, I know that I had a lot of conference calls and I talked to people in Singapore and Munich and everything like that, but I didn't really, really appreciate the effect of that uh, until COVID happens, which means, you know, Joe Murphy, where you're, you're a global expert now. You are a global expert in the industry that you have, and you're not really constrained by the Atlanta metro area, the Georgia Southeast you could you could handle matters in Vietnam, you know, for the right affiliation with people. Um, this idea of uh, geography being at some level as, as a tether, I think, has been snipped. And I think anyone, anywhere, on any topic is now fair game. And so, you know, within the community, it's about making the right connections and positing yourself and your services to say, you know what, you know, looks like. Um, you know, energy's got a problem with pipelines in a Canadian company. It's, you know, an energy company. They got pipelines that are going through, um, you know, Native American territories and they've got all kinds of issues. You know, I wonder if I know somebody who works for that company in the legal department. Those are the kinds of things that lend themselves. Do you really want to go through the tribal courts on that? They're very sticky. I'm not you know, tribal courts are great, but I'm saying it ends up being a very expensive, convoluted process that nobody's really probably ever said, you know, uh, what's what's a, a new and novel fix for this kind of situation? And I, so, I mean, that's a new concept there. I think geographically, we were completely untethered now. Wherever your chair is, if you've got a virtual connection, your services can be provided in whatever your area expertise is across the globe. Thank you, Terry. And uh, before we conclude, I'm going to just open it up. Do you have any parting comments? A lot of the audience for this particular talk will be uh, folks like yourself who are involved in, in law firms, the law firm side of this, uh, client management side of it. But uh, a large part of the group that uh, tune in for the uh, for our content is ADR professionals and people who run ADR groups. 
uh, any, any words of advice for someone who's seeking to take an opportunity that can be gained out of the current situation moving forward, how they would approach uh, uh, law firms? You, you've obviously touched on some of this just a moment ago, but anything you'd add to those remarks about what approaches they might consider taking as they're, again, trying, I, want, I don't want to say exploit this as a business opportunity, but basically to make the lemonade out of the lemons. Yeah, no, I think it is. It's not even exploited. It's a legitimate business opportunity. And really what they're doing is affording a, a strategic view on this, you know, and I don't mean it with a small S, I mean with a big S, which is it's a huge strategic lever. I, you know, prior remarks, we used it at large scale at AIG. I think it had it kind of fallen out of limelight with a lot of the clients. My recommendation for folks is to, um, and I'm going to sound a bit dated, but work your Rolodex, you know, get on LinkedIn, see what, you know, colleagues of yours, what people who have maybe moved to other law firms that are out of state or joined large global law firms and connect them with certain, um, you know, uh, clients. So there's always that client nexus, you know, so-and-so the, any law firm website has a laundry list of who they represent. If you have a particular expertise in an area along those industries, it could just be experiential. You know, you may have been in insurance law for a really long time before you, you know, came over and, and you know, augmented your practice. You know, make that connection and, and come with an articulated idea. I mean, I didn't necessarily buy every idea that law firms presented to me. And I had a lot of law firms come and say, have I got the, the idea for you? I've got the deal for you. We've got this all figured out. But the reality was I, I never, I could always discern on the ones that gave a well thought out, well articulated approach. And, and that firm stuck with me. Now, sometimes it, I, I always say to them, I wish you'd come to me beforehand because you only hit two of my 10 of my pain points. Um, in this, but you gave this incredible amount of thought from your chair as a law firm. And I think you, I, would, I would actually recommend that same practice. Think about where you are in the market. Think about you know, the client area you have in a law firm context and come up with your business strategy, your plan, and then start putting it out to people, get the feedback. Even if it's a, take a look at this, what do you think and get the feedback. You become top of, top of mind. People talk about that internally at law firms. They talk about it internally at the client and they're giving you feedback and you're incorporating that. And then, you know, it, it, you just take one, you know, let's see, you know, you're not looking to win all of them. You're really looking to probably get one really solid engagement out of that, that that'll lead to a lot of work. Right. And if I'm hearing you correctly, a large part of what you're talking about is anyone who's approaching a law firm with that thought in mind needs to do their homework. They need to know what the needs are that, that these, these folks are facing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I never cease to be amazed with the, the, the people that you connect with on LinkedIn. And 10 minutes after you connect with them, they send you a pitch that has nothing to do with uh, anything that you actually handle. If they took the slightest moment to review your profile, they'd know that they're pitching the wrong person. I just, it sounds to me like the ones who would do their homework, understand the needs of the firms they're approaching and be able to address those with a well thought out plan would be better received than otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been my experience 10 times out of 10. Well, Terry, we have reached, uh, believe it or not, a full hour of discussion. Um, I'm very sorry that you don't have uh, anything to cheer for regarding your Red Sox this year, but you know, Atlanta <laughs> is your adopted team and uh, it is. please uh, join us in pulling for them today uh, uh, as they uh, begin. Uh, and I, and, I, and I, I violated rule number one of any kind of uh, presentation that you make evergreen concepts being, you don't mention anything that's, that's current at the moment, but it's hard not to, if you're an Atlanta Braves fan uh, to be in the moment, but thank you again. I know your time is very valuable. It's uh, been a, a, a real pleasure to, uh, to rekindle our, our, uh, our uh, conversations that we used to have a lot around the firm. And um, I'm very impressed with your meteoric rise and uh, continue to be so as I follow the uh, tr trend of your career. Thank you again for, for joining us. And I look forward to uh, seeing uh, uh, your predictions come true. All right, Joe. Thank you so much again. It was a true pleasure. All right. Bye-bye.